due process, the rights to life, liberty, and property. Q. Give examples of acts of the state which infringe the due process clause in its substantive aspect and its procedural aspect. Answer. Substantive due process requires that the law itself, not merely the procedures by which the law would be enforced, is fair, reasonable, and just. It is violated when it is unreasonable or unduly oppressive. For example, Presidential Decree Number 1717, which cancelled all the mortgages and liens of a debtor, was considered unconstitutional for being oppressive. Likewise, as stated in Ermita Malade Hotel and Motel Operators v. City Mayor of Manila, a law which is vague that men of common intelligence must guess its meaning and differ as to its application violates substantive due process. Number two, procedural due process refers to the method or manner by which the law is enforced in state prosecutors versus Muro 236 505. It was held that the dismissal of a case without the benefit of a hearing and without any notice to the prosecution violated due process. Likewise, as held in People versus Court of Appeals, the lack of impartiality of the judge who will decide a case violates procedural due process. Q. On April 6, 1963, police officer Mario Gadula was charged by the mayor with grave misconduct and violated of violation of law before the municipal board. The board investigated Gatula, but before the case could be decided, the city charter was approved. The city fiscal, citing Section 30 of the city charter, asserted that he was authorized thereunder to investigate city officers and employees. The case against Gatula was then forwarded to him, and a reinvestigation was conducted. The office of the fiscal subsequently recommended dismissal. On January 11, 1966, the city mayor returned the records of the case to the city fiscal for the submission of an appropriate resolution, but no resolution was submitted. On March 3, 1968, the city fiscal transmitted the records to the city mayor, recommending that final action thereon be made by the City Board of Investigators, CBI. Although the CBI did not conduct an investigation, the records show that both the municipal board and the fiscal's office exhaustively heard the case, with both parties afforded ample opportunity to adduce their evidence and argue their cause. The police commission found Gatula guilty on the basis of the records forwarded by the CBI. Gatula challenged the adverse decision of the police commission, theorizing that he was deprived of due process. Questions. Is the police commission bound by the findings of the city fiscal? Is Gatula's protestation of lack of non-observance of due process well-grounded? Explain your answers. The police commission is not bound by the findings of the city fiscal. In Malumat v. De La Cruz, 163-608, it was held that the police commission is not prohibited from making its own findings on the basis of its own evaluation of the records. Likewise, the protestation of lack of due process is not well grounded, since the hearing before the municipal board and the city fiscal offered Gatula the chance to be heard. There is no denial of due process if the decision was rendered on the basis of evidence contained in the record and disclosed to the parties affected. Q. On November 7, 1990, nine lawyers of the legal department of Y Bank, who were all under Fred Torrey, sent a complaint to management accusing Torrey of abusive conduct and mismanagement. Furnished with a copy of the complaint, Torrey denied the charges. Two days later, the lawyers and Tory were called to a conference in the office of the ward chairman to give their respective sides of the controversy. However, no agreement was reached thereat. Bank Director Romulo Moret was tasked to look further into the matter. He met with the lawyers together with Tory several times, but to no avail. Moret then submitted a report sustaining the charges of the lawyer. The board chairman wrote Torre to inform him that the bank had chosen the compassionate option of waiting for Torre's resignation. Torre was asked, without being dismissed, to turn over the documents of all cases handled by him to another official of the bank, but Torre refused to resign and requested for a full hearing. Days later, he reiterated his request for a full hearing, claiming that he had been constructively dismissed. Moret assured Torre that he is free to remain in the employ of the bank, even if he has no particular work assignment. After another request for a full hearing was ignored, Torre filed a complaint with the arbitration branch of NLRC for illegal dismissal, reaching thereto the bank terminated the services of Torre. Was Torre constructively dismissed before the 
before he filed his complaint? Answer. Torrey was constructively dismissed as held in Equitable Banking Corporation versus National Labor Relations Commission 273-352, allowing an employee to report for work without being assigned any work constitute constructive dismissal. Question B. Given the multiple meetings held among the bank officials, the lawyers, and Torrey, is it correct for him to say that he was not given an opportunity to be heard? Explain. Answer. Tori is correct in saying that he was not given the chance to be heard. The meetings in the nature of consultations and conferences cannot be considered as valid substitutes for the proper observance of notice and hearing. Q. The Philippine Ports Authority PPA General Manager issued an administrative order to the effect that all existing regular appointments to harbor pilot positions shall remain valid only up to December 31st of the current year and that henceforth all appointments to harbor pilot positions shall be only for a term of one year from date of effectivity, subject to yearly renewal or cancellation by the PPA after conduct of a rigid evaluation of performance. Pilotage as a profession may be practiced only by duly licensed individuals who have to pass five government professional examinations. The Harbor Pilot Association challenged the validity of said administrative order, arguing that it violated the Harbor Pilot's right to exercise their profession and their right to due process of law, and that the said administrative order was issued without prior notice and hearing. The PPA counter that the administrative order was valid as it was issued in the exercise of its administrative control and supervision over harbor pilot under PPS legislative charter, and that in issuing the order as a rule or regulation, it was performing its executive or legislative and not a quasi-judicial function. Due process of law is classified in two kinds, namely procedural due process and substantive due process of law. Was there or was there no violation of the harbor pilot's right to exercise their profession and their right to due process? Answer: The right of the harbor pilots to due process was violated, as held in Corona versus United Harbor Pilots Association of the Philippines 283 Squad 31. Pilotage as a profession is a property right protected by the guarantee of due process. The pre-evaluation cancellation of the license of the harbor pilots every year is unreasonable and violated their right to substantive due process. The renewal is dependent on the evaluation after the licenses have been cancelled. The issuance of the administrative order also violated procedural due process since no prior public hearing was conducted as held in CIR versus CA 261 SQUA 237. When a regulation is being issued under the quasi-legislative authority of an administrative agency, the requirements of notice, hearing, and publication must be observed. Q. Ten public school teachers of Kalookan City left their classroom to join a strike, which lasted for one month to ask for teachers' benefit. The Department of Education, Culture, and Sport charged them administratively, for which reason they were required to a. and formally investigated by a committee composed of the division superintendent of schools as chairman, the division supervisor as member, and a teacher as another member. On the basis of the evidence adduced at the formal investigation, which humbly established their guilt, the director rendered a decision meting out to them the penalty of removal from office. The decision was affirmed by the tax secretary and the civil service commission. On appeal, they reiterated the arguments they raised before the administrative bodies, namely, they were deprived of due process of law as the investigating committee was improperly constituted because it did not include a teacher in a representation of the teacher's organization as required by the Magna Carta for public school teachers. A. The teachers were deprived of due process of law. Under Section 9 of the Magna Carta of public school teachers, one of the members of the committee must be a teacher who is a representative of the local or in its absence, an existing provincial or national organization of teachers, according to Fabella v. CA 283-256, to be considered the authorized representative of such organization, the teacher must be chosen by the organization itself and not by the Secretary of Education, Culture, and Sports, since in administrative proceedings, due process requires that the tribunal be vested with jurisdiction and be 
so constituted as to afford a person charged administratively a reasonable guarantee of impartiality if the teacher who is a member of the committee was not appointed in accordance with the law any proceeding before it tainted with deprivation of procedural due process q the municipal council of the municipality of Kuagua, pampanga passed an ordinance penalizing any person to entity or entity engaged in the business of selling tickets to movies or other public exhibitions games or performances which would charge children below 7 and 12 years of age the full price of admission tickets instead of only one half of the amount thereof would you hold the ordinance a valid exercise of legislative power by the municipality why answer the ordinance is void as held in Balakquit versus CFI of Agusan del Norte 163 square 182 the ordinance is unreasonable it deprives the seller of the tickets of their property without due process a ticket is a property right and may be sold for such price as the owner of it can obtain there is nothing pernicious in charging children the same price as adults Q. The city mayor issues an executive order declaring that the city promotes responsible parenthood and upholds natural family planning. He prohibits all hospitals operated by the city from prescribing the use of artificial methods of contraception, including condoms, pills, intrauterine devices, and surgical sterilization. As a result, poor women in his city lost their access to affordable family planning programs. Private clinics, however, continue to run their family planning, counsel, and devices to paying clients. A. Question. Is the executive order in any way constitutionally infirm? Explain. Answer. The executive order is constitutionally infirm. It violates the guarantee of due process and equal protection. Due process includes the right to decisional privacy, which refers to the ability to make one's own decision and to act on those decisions free from governmental or other unwanted interference. Forbidding the use of artificial methods of contraception infringes on the freedom of choice in matters of marriage and family life. Chris Walt v. Connecticut, 381 U.S. 415. Moreover, the executive order violates equal protection as it discriminates against poor women in the city who cannot afford to pay private clinics. Question B. Is the Philippines in breach of any obligation under international law? Explain. The acts of the city mayor may be attributed to the Philippines under the principle of state responsibility. Article 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights require that Philippine law shall prohibit any discrimination and shall guarantee to all persons equal and effective protection against discrimination on any grounds such as social origin, birth, or other status. The executive order of the city mayor discriminates against pure, poor women. Question C. May the Commission on Human Rights order the mayor to stop the implementation of the executive order? Explain. The Commission on Human Rights cannot order the city mayor to stop the implementation of his executive order because it has no power to issue writs of injunction. Export Processing Zone Authority or PESA versus Commission on Human Rights. Question. The Philippine National Police PNP issued a circular to all its members directed at the style and length of male police officers' hair, sideburns, and mustache as well as the size of their waistlines. It prohibits birds, goatees, and waistlines over 38 inches, except for medical reason. Some police officers questioned the validity of the circular, claiming that it violated their right to liberty under the Constitution. Resolve the controversy. Answer. The circular is valid. The circular is based on desire to make police officers easily recognizable to the members of the public or to inculcate spirit the courts which such similarity is felt to inculcate within the police force. Either one is a sufficient rational justification for the circular. Kelly V. Johnson, 425 U.S. 238. Constitutional and statutory due process. Question. Does a permit to carry firearm outside residence or PTCFOR constitute a property right protected by the Constitution? Answer. No, it is not a property right under the due process clause of the Constitution. Just like ordinary licenses in other regulated fields, it may be revoked at any time. It does not all confer an absolute right, but only a personal privilege subject to restrictions.
A licensee takes his license subject to such conditions as the legislature sees fit to impose, and may be revoked at its pleasure without depriving the license of any property. Chavez v. Romulo, GR number 157036. Hierarchy of Rights Q. What do you understand by the term hierarchy of civil liberties? Explain. Answer. The hierarchy of civil liberties means that freedom of expression and the rights of peaceful assembly are superior to property rights. Philippine Blooming Mills versus Philippine Blooming Mills. Void for Vagueness Doctrine. Question. What is the doctrine of void for vagueness? In what context can it be correctly applied? Not correctly applied. Explain. A statute is vague when it lacks comprehensible standards that men of common intelligence guess as to its meaning and differs as to its application. It applies to both free speech cases and penal statutes. However, a, fa a facial challenge on the ground of vagueness can be made only in free speech cases. It does not apply to penal statutes. Southern Hemisphere Engagement Network versus Anti-Terrorism Council. Q. Compare and contrast overbreath doctrine from void, of, void for vagueness doctrine. While the overbreath doctrine decrees that a governmental purpose may not be achieved by means in a statute which sweep unnecessary broadly and thereby invades the area of protected freedom, a statute is void for vagueness when it forbids or requires the doing of an act in terms so vague that men of common intelligence cannot necessarily guess it, its meaning, and differ to its application. Estrada v. Sandigan Bayan, 369 Squaw, 394. Equal Protection. Q. The Department of Education, Culture, and Sports issued a circular disqualifying anyone who fails for the fourth time in the national entrance test from admission to a college or of dentistry. X, who was thus disqualified, questions the constitutionality of the circular. Did the circular violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution? Answer, no. The circular did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. There is a substantial distinction between dentistry student and other students. The dental profession directly affects the lives and health of people. Other prof professions do not involve the same delicate responsibility and need not be similarly treated. And Q. Undaunted by his three failures in the National Medical Admission Test, or NMAT, Cruz applied to take, take it again, for, but he was refused because of an order of the Department of Education, Culture, and Sports, or DEX, disallowing flunkers from taking the test a fourth time. Cruz filed suit assailing this rule, raising the constitutional grounds of accessible quality education, academic freedom, and equal protection. The government opposes this, upholding the constitutionality of the rule on the ground of exercise of police power. Decide a case discussing the grounds raised. Answer. As held in Department of Education, Culture and Sports v. San Diego 180 Squaw 533, the rule is a valid exercise of police power to ensure that those admitted to the medical profession are qualified. The arguments of Cruz are not meritorious. The right to quality education and academic freedom are not absolute. Under Section 5.3, Article 14 of the Constitution, the right to choose a profession is subject to fair, reasonable, and equitable admission and academic requirements. The rule does not violate equal protection. There is a substantial distinction between medical students and other students. Unlike other professions, the medical profession directly affects the life of the people. Q. The Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Youth Association, or GBTYA, an organization of gay, bisexual, and transgender persons, filed for accreditation with the COMELEC to join the forthcoming party list election. The COMELEC denied the application for accreditation on the ground that GBTYA espouses immorality, which offends religious dogmas. GBTYA challenges the denial of its application based on moral grounds because it violates its right to equal protection of the law. Question: What are the three levels of tests that are applied in equal protection cases? Answer: The three levels of tests applied in equal protection cases are as follows. First, the strict scrutiny test, which is applied when the legislative classification disadvantages a subject class or impinges upon a fundamental right. The statute must fail unless the government can show that the classification serve a compelling 
governmental interest. Second, the intermediate scrutiny test, when the classification, while not facially invidious, gives rise to recurring constitutional difficulties or disadvantages a quasi-suspect class, the law must not only further an important government interest and be related to that interest. The justification must be genuine and must not depend on broad generalization. Lastly, the rationality test. If neither the strict nor the intermediate scrutiny is appropriate, the statute will be tested for mere nationality. Rationality. The presumption is in favor of the classification, the reasonableness and fairness of state action, and of legitimate grounds of distinction. Question B. Which of the three levels of tests should be applied to the present case? Answer. Classification on the basis of sexual orientation is a quasi-subject classification that prompts intermediate review. Sexual orientation has no relation to a person's ability to contribute to society. The discrimination that distinguishes the gays and lesbian persons are beyond their control. The group lacks sufficient political strength to bring an end to discrimination through political means. Ang Lad Lad versus Komalek. Alternative answer, the three levels of test that may be applied in equal protection cases may be classified as follows. The strict scrutiny test for laws dealing with freedom of the mind or restricting the political processes, the rational basis standard for the review of economic legislation, and heightened or intermediate scrutiny for evaluating classification based on gender and legitimacy. Number two. It is submitted that the strict scrutiny test should be applied in this case because the challenge classification restricts the political process. Q. A law is passed intended to protect women and children from all forms of violence. When a woman perceives an act to be an act of violence or a threat of violence against her, she may apply for a barangay protection order or BPO to be issued by the barangay chairman which shall have the force and effect of law. Conrado, against whom a BPO had been issued on petition of his wife, went to court to challenge the constitutionality of the law. He raises the following grounds. Letter A. The law violates the Equal Protection Clause because while it extends protection to women who may be victims of violence by their husbands, it does not extend the same protection to husbands who may be battered by their wife. Letter B. The grant of authority to the Barangay Chairman to issue a Barangay Protection Order BPO constitute an undue delegation of judicial power because, obviously, the issuance of the BPO entails the exercise of judicial power. Rule on the validity of the grounds raised by Conrado, with reasons. Answer. The law does not violate the Equal Protection Clause. It is based on substantial distinctions. The unequal power relationship between women and men, the greater likelihood for women than men to be victims of violence, and the widespread gender bias and prejudice against women all make for real difference. Garcia v. Drillon Letter B. The grant of authority to the Barangay Chairman to issue a Barangay Protection Order is a purely executive function pursuant to his duty to enforce all laws and ordinances and to maintain public order. The same case, Garcia v. Drillon 599 SCA 352 searches and seizures q a is an alien s- state whether in the philippines he is entitled to the right against illegal illegal searches and seizures against illegal arrest answer aliens are entitled to the right against illegal searches and seizures and illegal arrest as applied in people versus chua hosan 307 squad 432 these rights are available to all persons, including aliens. Q. One day, a passenger bus conducted conductor found a man's handbag left in the bus. When the conductor opened the bag, he found inside a calling card with the owner's name, Dante Galang, and address, a few hundred peso bills, and a small plastic bag containing a white powdery substance. He brought the powdery substance to the National Bureau of Investigation for Laboratory Examination, and it was determined to be metamphetamine, hydrochloride or shabu, a prohibited drug. Then Tigalang was subsequently traced and found and brought to the NBI office, 
where he admitted ownership of the handbag and its contents in the course of the interrogation by NBI agents, and without the presence and assistance of counsel, Gallon was made to sign a receipt for the plastic bag and its shabu contents. Gallon was charged with illegal possession of prohibited drugs and was convicted. On appeal, he contends that the plastic bag and its contents are inadmissible in evidence, being the product of an illegal search and seizure. Decide the case with reason. Answer. The plastic bag and its contents are admissible in evidence since it was not the National Bureau of Investigation but the bus conductor who opened the bag and brought it to the National Bureau of Investigation as held in People v. Marty. The constitutional right against unreasonable search and seizure is a restraint from the government. It does not apply so as to require inclusion of evidence which came into the possession of the government through a search made by a private citizen. Q. Pornographic materials in the form of tabloids, magazines, and other printed materials proliferate and are being sold openly in the street of Masaya City. The city mayor organized a task force which confiscated these materials. He then ordered that the materials be burned in public. Dominador, publisher of the magazine Plaything, filed a suit raising the following constitutional issues. A. The confiscation of the materials constituted an illegal search and seizure because the same was done without a valid search warrant. And B. The confiscation as well as the proposed destruction of the materials is a denial of the right to disseminate information and thus violates the constitutional right to freedom of expression. Is either or both contentions proper? Answer. The confiscation of the materials constituted an illegal search and seizure because it was done without a valid search warrant. It cannot be justified as a valid warrantless search and seizure because such search and seizure must have been an incident of a lawful arrest. There was no lawful arrest. Pita v. Court of Appeals, 178 Squaw, 362. The argument of Dominador that pornographic materials are protected by the constitutional right to freedom of expression is erroneous. Obscenity is not protected expression. Fernando v. Court of Appeals, 510 Squaw, 351. Section 2 of Presidential Decree No. 969 requires the forfeiture and destruction of pornographic materials. Nograles v. People, 660 Squaw, 475. Warrant Requirement Q. Armed with a search and seizure warrant, a team of policemen led by Inspector Trias entered a compound and searched the house described therein as number 17, Speaker Press, Santaman Mesa Heights, Quezon City, owned by Mr. Ernani Pellets for a reported cache of firearms and ammunition. However, upon thorough search of the house, the police found nothing. Then, acting on a hunch, the policeman proceeded to a smaller house inside the same compound with address at number 17A, Speaker Perez Street, entered it and conducted a search therein, over the objection of Mr. Pellets, who happened to be the same owner of the first house. There, the police found unlicensed fine firearms and ammunition they were looking for. As a result, Mr. Ernani Pellets was criminally charged in court with illegal possession of firearms and ammunition as penalized under PD 1866 as amended by RA 8294. At a trial, he vehemently objected to the presentation of the evidence against him for being inadmissible. Is Mr. Ermani Pallet's contention valid or not? Why? The contention of Ermani Pallet is valid as held in People v. CA 291 Squaw 400. If the place search is different from that stated in the search warrant, the evidence seized is inadmissible. The policeman cannot modify the place to be searched as set out in the search warrant. Warrantless search as Q. Crack officers of the Antinarcotics Unit were assigned on surveillance of the environs of a cemetery where the sale and use of dangerous drugs are rampant. A man with reddish and glassy eyes was walking unsteadily moving towards them, but veered away when he sensed the presence of policemen. They approached him, introduced themselves as police officers, and asked him what he had clenched in his hand. 
as he kept mum. The policeman pried his hand open and found a sachet of shabu, a dangerous drug. Accordingly, charged in court, the accused objected to the admission in evidence of the dangerous drug because it was the result of an illegal search and seizure. Rule on the objection. B. What are the instances when warrantless searches may be affected? Answer. Letter A. The objection is not tenable. In accordance with Manilili v. C.A. 280 square 400, since the accused had red eyes and was walking unsteadily, and the place is a known hangout of drug addicts, the police officers had sufficient reasons to stop the accused and frisk him. Since Shabu was actually found during the investigation, it could not be seized. It could be seized without the need for a search warrant. Letter B. A warrantless search may be affected in the following cases. Number one, searches incidental to a lawful arrest. Number two, searches of moving vehicles. Number three, searches of prohibited articles in plain view. Number four, enforcement of custom law. Number five, consented searches. Number six, stop and frisk people versus Monaco. Monaco. 285 Scross 703. Number 7. Routine searches at borders and ports of entry. U.S. vs. Romsey 431 U.S. 606. And number 8. Searches of businesses in the exercise of visitorial powers to enforce police regulations. New York vs. Berger 282 U.S. 691. Q. A witness to hooded men with baseball bats enter the house of their next door. They were B. After a few seconds, he heard B shouting, Wag bilo, babayaran kita, agad. Then A saw the two hooded men hitting B until the latter fell lifeless. The assailants escaped using a yellow motorcycle with a fireball sticker on it toward the direction of an exclusive village nearby. A reported the incident to P.O. 1. Nuval. The following day, B01 Nuval saw the motorcycle parked in the garage of a house of Santa Ines Street inside the exclusive village. He inquired with a caretaker as to who owned the motorcycle. The caretaker named the brothers Pilo and Ramon Maradona, who were then outside the country. B01 Nuval insisted on getting inside the garage. Out of fear, the caretaker allowed him. B01 Nuval took two ski masks and two bats inside the motorcycle. Was the search valid? What about the seizure? Decide with reason. The warrantless arrest, the warrantless search and the seizure was not valid. It was not made as an incident to a lawful warrantless arrest. People vs. Baula, 344 Scra, 663. The caretaker had no authority to waive the right of the brothers Pilo and Ramon, Maradona, to waive their right against an unreasonable search and seizure. People versus Damasso, 212, Scra, 547. The warrantless seizure of the ski mask and the bats cannot be justified under the plain view doctrine because they were seized after an invalid intrusion into the house. People versus Bolosa, 321, Scra, 459. Q. When can evidence in plain view be seized without need of search warrant? Explain. Answer, evidence in plain view can be seized without need of a search warrant if the following elements are present. Number one, there was a prior valid intrusion based on the valid warrantless arrest in which the police were illegally present pursuant of their duties. Number two, the evidence was inadvertently discovered by the police who had the right to be where they were. Number three, the evidence must be immediately apparent. And number four, Plain view justified seizure of the evidence without further search. Del Rosario vs. People, 358-372. Q. Around 12 midnight, a team of police officers was in routine patrol in Barangay Makatarungan when it noticed an open delivery van neatly covered with banana leaves. Believing that the van was loaded with contraband, the team leader flagged down the vehicle which was driven by Hades. He inquired from Hades what was loaded on the, va on the van. Hades just gave the police officer a blank stare and started to perspire profusely. The police officer then told Hades that they will look inside the vehicle. Hades did not make any reply. The police officers then lifted the banana leaves and saw several boxes. 
they opened the box and discovered several kilos of shabu inside. Hayes was charged with illegal possession of illegal drugs. After due proceedings, he was convicted by the trial court on appeal. The Court of Appeal affirmed his conviction. In his final bid for exoneration, Hayes went to the Supreme Court claiming that his constitutional right against unreasonable searches and seizure was violated when the police officers searched his vehicle without a warrant. That the shabu confiscated from him is thus inadmissible in evidence, and that there being no evidence against him, he is entitled to an acquittal. For its part, the people of the Philippines maintains that the case of hate involved a consented warrantless search which is legally recognized. The people advert to the fact that Hayes did not offer any protest when the police officers officer asked him if they could look inside a vehicle. Thus, any evidence obtained in the course thereof is admissible in evidence, whose claim is correct. Answer. The warrantless search was illegal. There was no probable cause to search the van. The shabu was not immediately apparent. It was discovered only after they opened the boxes. The mere passive silence of hate did not constitute consent to the warrantless search. Cabalets versus CA 373-221 Q. Johan learned that the police were looking for him in connection with the rape of an 18-year-old girl, a neighbor. He went to the police station a week later and presented himself to the desk sergeant. Coincidentally, the rape victim was in the premises executing an extrajudicial statement to Han, along with six other suspects, was placed in a police lineup and the girl pointed to him as the rapist. Johan was arrested and locked up in a cell. Johan was charged with rape in court but prior to arraignment, invoked his right to preliminary investigation. This was denied by the judge and thus trial proceeded. After the prosecution presented several witnesses, Johan true counsel invoked the right to bail and filed a motion thereof, which was denied outright by the judge. Johan now files a petition for certiorari before the Court of Appeals, arguing that his arrest was not in accordance with law. Decide. Answer. Yes. The warrant last arrest of Johan was not in accordance with law, as held in Go versus Court of Appeals, 206 Gra. 138. His case does not fall under the instances in Rule 113, Section 5, Letter A of the 1997 Rules of Criminal Procedure, authorizing warrantless arrest. It cannot be considered a valid warrantless arrest because Johan did not commit a crime in the presence of the police officers. Since they were not present when Johan had allegedly raped his neighbor, neither can it be considered an arrest under Rule 113, Section 5, Letter B, which allows an arrest without a warrant to be made when a crime has in fact just been committed and the person making the arrest has personal knowledge of sets indicating that the person to be arrested committed it. Since Johan was arrested a week after the alleged rape, it cannot be deemed to be a crime which has just been committed, nor did the police officers who arrested him have personal knowledge of facts indicating that Johan raped his neighbor. Privacy of Communication and Correspondence Q. In a criminal prosecution for murder, the prosecution presented as witness an employee of the Manila Hotel who produced a, in court a videotape recording showing the heated exchange between the accused and the victim that took place at the lobby of the hotel barely 30 minutes before the killing. The accused objects to the admission of the videotape recording on the ground that it was taken without his knowledge or consent in violation of its right to privacy and the anti wiretaping taping law. Resolve the objection with reason. Answer. The objection should be overruled. What the law prohibits is the overhearing, intercepting, and recording of private communications. Since the, vi the, since the exchange of heated words was not private, its videotape recording is not prohibited. Freedom of expression, concept and scope. Q. May the Comelec prohibit the posting of the decals and stickers on mobile places, public or private, such as on private vehicle, and limit their location only to the authorized posting areas that the Comelec itself fixes? Explain. Answer. According to the case of Andion v. Comelec 207-712, the provision is null and void on constitutional grounds. 
The regulation strikes at the freedom of an individual to express his presence and by displaying it on his car to convince others to agree with him. A sticker may be furnished by a candidate, but once the car owner agrees to have it placed on his private vehicle, the expression becomes a statement by the owner, primarily his own and not of anybody else. Moreover, the restriction as to where the decals and stickers should be posted is so broad that it encompasses even the citizen's private property, which in this case is a privately owned vehicle. It deprives an individual to his right to property without due process of law. Q. The Star, a national daily newspaper, carried an exclusive report stating that Senator XX received a house and lot located at YY Street, McCaddy, in consideration for his vote cutting cigarette taxes by 50%. The Senator sued the Star, it re its reporter, editor, and publisher for libel, claiming the report was completely false and malicious. According to the Senator, there is no YY Street in Makati, and the tax cut was only 20%. He claimed 1 million pesos in damages. The defendants denied actual malice, claiming privileged communication and absolute freedom of the press to report on public officials in matters of public concern. If there was an error, the star said it would publish the correction promptly. Is there actual malice in the star's re reportage? How is actual malice defined? Are the defendants liable for damages? Damages? Answer. Since Senator Excess is a public person, the question imputation is directed against him in his public capacity. In this case, actual malice means the statement was made with knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. Borhal versus CA 301 Scrap. Since there is no proof that the report was published with knowledge that it is false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not, the defendants are not liable for damage. Q. Nationwide protests have erupted over rising gas prices, including disruptive demonstrations in many universities throughout the country. The Metro Manila State University, a public university, adopted a university-wide circular prohibiting public mass demonstration and rallies without the camp within the campus. Offended by the circular, militant students spread word that on the following Friday, all students were to wear black t-shirts as a symbol of their protest both against high gas prices and the university ban on demonstration. The effort was only moderately successful, with around 30% of the students heeding the call. Nonetheless, university officials were outraged and compelled the students' leaders to explain why they should not be expelled for violating the circular against demonstrations. The student leader approached you for legal advice. They contended that they should not be expelled since they did not violate the circular. Their protest action being neither a demonstrator nor a rally since all they did was wear black t-shirts. What would you advise the students? Answer. I shall advise the students that the circular is void. The constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech and peaceful assembly extends to students within the premises of the Metro Manila State University. Malabanan v. Remente, 129 Scra, 359. I shall also advise the students that their wearing of black t-shirt of a sign of protest is covered by their freedom of speech because it is closely akin to free speech. Tinker v. Des Moines, Des Moines, Des Moines Community School District. Q. Surveys Galore is an outfit involved in conducting nationwide surveys. In one such survey, it asked the people about the degree of trust and confidence they had in several institutions of the government. When the results came, the judiciary was shown to be less trusted than most of the government offices. The results were then published by the mass media. Ascension. A trial court judge felt particularly offended by the news. He then issued a shock cost order against surveys galore directing the survey entity to explain why it should not be cited in contempt for coming up with such a survey and publishing the results, which were so unflattering and degrading to the dignity of the judiciary. Survey Galore immediately assailed the show cost order of Judge Ascension, arguing that it is violative of the constitutional guarantee of freedom of expression. Is the survey's Galore petition meritorious? Answer. The petition of surveys galore is meritorious. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press may be identified 
with a liberty to discuss publicly and truthfully any matter of public interest without censorship and punishment. There should be no previous restraint on the communication of views or subsequent liability whether in libel suits, prosecution for sedition, or action for damages, or contempt proceedings unless there is a clear and present danger of substantive evil that Congress has a right to prevent. Chavez v. Gonzalez, 545 Scra. Freedom of speech should not be impaired through the exercise of the power to punish to for contempt, of course, unless the statement in question is a serious and imminent threat to the administration of justice. Here, the publication of the result of the survey was not intended to degrade the judiciary. Cabansag v. Fernandez, 102 Phil, 152. Q. Public school teachers stage for days must actions at the Department of Education, Culture and Sports to press for the immediate grant of their demand for additional pay. The DEX secretary issued to them a notice of the illegality of their unauthorized action, ordered them to immediately return to work and warned them of impossible sanctions. They ignored this and continued with their mass action. The DEX secretary issued orders for the preventive suspension without pay and charged the teachers with gross misconduct and gross neglect of duty for an authorized abandonment of teaching posts and absences without leave. Questions. Are employees in the public sector allowed to form unions to strike? Why? B. The teachers claim that their rights to peaceful assembly and petition the government for redress of grievances has been curtailed. Are they correct? Why? Answer. Section 8. Article 3 of the Constitution allows employees in the public sector to form unions. However, they cannot go on strike, as, as explained in Social Security System Employee Association v. CA, 175 SCRA 686. The terms and conditions of their employment are fixed by law. Employees in the public sector cannot strike to secure concession from their employer. B. The teachers cannot claim that their right to peaceful Assemble and petition for the redress of grievances has been curtailed. According to Bangalisan v. CA 276 Scra, they can exercise this right without stoppage of classes. Q. Ten public school teachers of Kalo City left their classroom to join a strike, which lasted for one month to ask for teachers' benefits. The Department of Education, Culture, and Sports desk charged them administratively, for which reason they were required to answer and formally investigated by a committee composed of the division superintendent of schools as chairman, the division supervisor as member, and a teacher as another member. On the basis of the evidence adduced at the formal investigation which amply established their guilt, the director rendered a decision meeting out, meeting out to them the penalty of removal from office. The decision was affirmed by the DAX Retards and Civil Service Commission. On appeal, they reiterated the argument they raised before the administrative bodies. Their strike was an exercise of their constitutional right to peaceful assembly and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Answer. According to De La Cruz v. C.A. 305, Scra. 303, the argument of the teachers that they were merely exercising their constitutional right to peaceful assembly and to petition the government for redress of grievances cannot be sustained, because such right must be exercised within reasonable limits. When such right were exercised on regular school days instead of during the free time of the teachers, the teachers committed acts prejudicial to the best interest of the service. Q. The Samahan of the Mahihirap SM filed with the Office of the City Mayor of Manila an application for permit to hold a rally on Medjola Street on September 5, 2006, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. to protest the political killings of journalists. However, the City Mayor denied their application on the ground that a rally at the time and place applied for will block the traffic the San Miguel and Quiapo streets, districts. He suggested the Li Liwasang Bonifacio which has been designated a Freedom Park as venue for the rally. Questions. Number one, does the SM have remedy to contest a denial of its application for a permit? 
Number two, does the availability of a Freedom Park justify the denial of SM application for a permit? Number three, is the requirement to apply for a permit to hold a rally a prior restraint on freedom of speech and assembly? Number four, assuming that despite the denial of SM application for a permit, its members hold a rally, prompting the police to arrest them, are the arrests without judicial warrants lawful? Answers to number one, yes, SM must a remedy. Under PD, BP, B, Bilang 880, the Public Assembly Act of 1885, in the event of denial of the application for a permit, the applicant may contest the decision in an appropriate court of law. The court must decide within 24 hours from the date of filing of the case. Said decision may be appealed to the appropriate court within 48 hours after receipt of the same. In all cases, any decision may be appealed to the Supreme Court. Payan Muna vs. Ermita. Number 2. No, the availability of a freedom park does not justify the denial of the permit. It does imply that no permits are required for activities in Freedom Park. Under B BP 880, the denial may be justified only if there is clear and convincing evidence that the public assembly will create a clear and present danger to public order, public safety, public convenience, public morals, or public health. Ayn Muda v. Ermita. Number 3 answer. No, the requirement for a permit holder rally is not a prior restraint of freedom of speech and assembly. The Supreme Court has held that the permit requirement is valid, referring to it as a regulation of the time, place, and manner of holding public public assemblies, but not the content of the speech itself. Thus, this is not no prior restraint, since the content of the speech is not relevant to the regulation. Number four, the arrests are unlawful. What is prohibited and penalized under Section 13, Letter A and 14A of BP 880 is the holding of any public assembly as defined in this act by any leader or organizer without having first secured that written permit where a permit is required from the office concern. Provided, however, that no person can be punished or held criminally liable for participating in or attending an otherwise peaceful assembly. Thus, only the leader or organizer of the rally without a permit may be arrested without a warrant, while the members may not be arrested, as they cannot be punished or held criminally liable for attending the rally. However, under Section 12 thereof, when the public assembly is held without a permit, where a permit is required, the said public assembly may be peacefully dispersed. Q. Batas Pamban sa 880. The public assembly law of 1985 regulates the conduct of all protest rallies in the Philippines. Salakay, Bayan, held a protest rally and planned to march from Quezon City to Luneta in Manila. They received a permit from the mayor of Quezon City, but not from the mayor of Manila. They were able to march in Quezon City and up to the boundary separating it from the city of Manila. Three meters after crossing the boundary, the Manila police stopped them for posing a danger to public safety. Was this a valid exercise of police power? Answer. Since the protesters were merely reached three meters beyond the boundary of Quezon City, the police authorities in Manila should not have stopped them as there was no clear and present danger to public order. In accordance with the policy of maximum tolerance. The police authorities should have asked the protesters to disperse and if they refuse, the public assembly may be dispersed peacefully. Alternate answers. The police officers may disperse the rally peacefully because the permit from the mayor of Quezon City is limit limited to Quezon City only and does not extend to the city of Manila and no permit was obtained from the mayor of Manila. Q. The security police of the Southern Luzon Expressway spotted a caravan of 20 vehicles with paper banners tapped on their sides and protesting graft and corruption in government. They were driving at 50 km per hour in a 40-90 km per hour zone. Some banners had been blown off by the wind and posed a hazard to other motorists. They were stopped by the security police. The protesters then proceeded to march instead sandwiched between the caravan vehicles. They were also stopped by the security force. May the security police validly stop the vehicles in the marcher? Answer. In accordance with the policy of maximum tolerance, 
the security police should not have stopped the protesters. They should have simply asked the protesters to take adequate steps to prevent their banners from being blown off, such as rolling them up while they were in the expressway, and requires the protesters to board their vehicle and proceed on their way. Alternate answer. The security police may stop the protesters to prevent public inconvenience because they were using the expressway for an appreciable length of time by marching while sandwiched between the caravan vehicles. Prior restraint. Q. In the morning of August 28, 1987, during the height of the fighting of Channel 4 in Camelot Hotel, the military closed the radio station XX, which was excitedly reporting the success of the rebels and movements toward Manila in troops friendly to the rebels. The reports were correct and factual. On October 6, 1987, after Normancy had returned to the government had full control of the situation, the National Telecommunications Commission, without notice and hearing, but merely on the basis of the report of the military, canceled the franchise of Station XX, discussed the legal legality. Number 1. A a question. The action taken against Station on August 28, 1987. And number two, the cancellation of the franchise of the station on October 6, 1987. Answer, the closing down of radio station XX during the fighting is permis permissible. With respect to news media, wartime censorship has been upheld on the ground that when a nation is at war, many things that might be said in time of peace are such a hindrance to its efforts that their utterance utter will not be endured so long as men fight and that no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. The security of community life may be protected against incitement to acts of violence and the overthrow by force of orderly government. Near versus Minnesota. Justice Holmes' opinion in Schenck versus United States. New York Times versus United States. With greater reason then, May censorship in times of emergency be justified in the case of broadcast media since their freedom is somehow somewhat lesser in scope. The impact of the vibrant speech, as Justice Gutierrez said, is forceful and immediate. Unlike readers of the printed work, a radio audience has lesser opportunity to cogitate, analyze, and reject the utterance. Eastern Broadcasting Corp. versus Dance. But the cancellation of the franchise of the station on October 6, 1987 without prior notice and hearing is void as held in 137 Square 647. The cardinal primary requirements in administrative proceedings, one of which is that the parties must first be heard, as laid down in Ang Tibay v. CIR 69 Phil 635, must be observed in closing a radio station because radio broadcasts are a form of constitutionally protected expression. Two, the Secretary of Transportation and Communications has warned radio station operators against selling blocked time on the claim that the time covered thereby are often used by those buying them to attack the present administration. Assume that the department implements this warning and orders owners and operators of radio station not to sell block time to interested parties without prior clearance from the Department of the Transportation and Communications. You were approached by an interested party affected adversely by that order of the Secretary of Transportation and Communications. What would you do regarding the ban on the sale of block time? Explain your answer. Answer, I would challenge its validity in court on the ground that it constitutes a prior restraint of freedom of expression. Such a limitation is valid only in exceptional cases, such as where the purpose is to prevent actual obstruction to recruitment of service or the sailing dates of transport or the number and location of troops, or for the purpose of enforcing the primary requirements of decency or the security of community life. Near versus Minnesota 3283 U.S. 697. Attacks on the government, on the other hand, cannot justify prior restraints, for as has been pointed out, the interests of society and the maintenance of good government demand a full discussion of public affairs. Complete liberty to comment on the conduct of public men is a scalpel on the case of free speech, United States v. Bustos, 37 Phil 741. The parties adversely affected may also disregard 
the regulation as being on its face void, as has been held. Any system of prior restraints of expression comes to the court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity, and the government thus carries a heavy burden of showing justification for the imposition of such a restraint. New York Times versus United States 403 U.S. 713. The usual presumption of validity that in here is in legislation is reversed in the case of laws imposing prior restraint on freedom of expression. Q. The KKK television network, KKK TV, aired the documentary case law, how the Supreme Court decides without obtaining the necessary permit required by PD 1986. Consequently, the movie and television review and classification board, MTC, MTCRCB, suspended the airing of KKK TV programs. MTC, MTRCB declared that under PD 1986, it has the power of prior review over all television programs except newsreels and programs by the government. And the subject documentary does not fall under either of these two classes. The suspension order was ostensibly based on Memorandum Circular 98-17, which grants MTC's MTC or CB, the authority to issue such an order. KKTV filed a certiorari petition in court, raising the following issues. The act of MTC, MTRCB constitutes prior restraint and violates the constitutional guaranteed freedom of expression. expression. Answer, the contention of KKTV is not tenable. The prior restraint is a valid exercise of police power. Television is a medium which reaches even the eyes and ears of children. Iglesia Cristo vs. CA. Alternate answer. The memo circular is unconstitutional. The act of the movie and television review and classification board constitute prior restraint and violates freedom of expression. Any system of prior restraint has against it a heavy presumption against its validity. Prior restraint is an abridgment of the freedom of expression. There is no showing that the airing of the programs would constitute a clear and present danger. 403 U.S. 713. Facial challenges and overbreadth doctrine. Question. What is the doctrine of overbreadth? In what context can it be correctly applied? Not correctly applied. Explain. A statute is overbroad when a government pursue to control or prevent activities constitutionally subject to state regulations is sought to be achieved by means which sweep unnecessarily broadly and invade the area of protected freedom. It applies both to free speech cases and penal statutes. However, a facial challenge on the ground of overbreath can only be made in free speech cases because of its chilling effect upon protected speech. A facial challenge on the ground of overbreath is not applicable to penal statutes because, in general, they have an interim effect. Southern Hemisphere Engagement Networks versus Anti-Terrorism Council. Question. In a protest rally along Padre Faura Street, Manila, Pedro Pula took up the stage and began shouting, Kayo mga kurakot kayo, magsisirisign na kayo. Kung hindi, manggugulo kami dito. You crap officials, you better resign now or else we will cause trouble here. Simultaneously, he brought out a rock and the size of a fist and pretend to hurl it at the flagpole area of a government building. He did not actually throw the rock. Police officers who were monitoring the situation immediately approached Pedro Pula and arrested him. He was prosecuted for sedition, seditious speech and was convicted. On appeal, Pedro Pula argued he was merely exercising his freedom of speech and freedom of expression guaranteed by the Bill of Rights decide with reason. Pedro Pula should be acquitted. Answer. His freedom of speech should not be limited in the absence of a clear and present danger of a substantive evil that the state had the right to prevent. He pretended to hurl a rock but did not actually throw it. He did not commit any act of lawless violence. David versus Macapagal Arroyo, 489 Squa 160. Question B. What are the two basic prohibitions of the freedom of speech and of the press? Clause. 
Explain. Answer. The two basic prohibitions on freedom of speech and freedom of the press are prior restraint and subsequent punishment. Chavez versus Gonzalez. Q. When, if a, when is a facial challenge to the constitutionality of a law on the ground of violation of the Bill of Rights traditionally allowed? Explain your answer. Answer. A facial challenge is one that is launched to assail the validity of statutes concerning not only protected speech but also all other rights in the First Amendment, including religious freedom, freedom of the press, and the rights of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. While the court has withheld the application of facial challenges to strictly penal statutes, it has expanded its scope to cover statutes not only regulating free speech, but also those involving religious freedom and other fundamental rights. For unlike its counterpart in the U.S., the court under its expanded jurisdiction is mandated by the fundamental law not only to settle actual controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and enforceable, but also to determine whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. Imbong vs. Ochoa Test Question Almighty Apostles is a relatively new religious group and movement with fast-growing membership. One time, Deep Troth, an investigative reporter, made a research and study as to what the group's leader, Mark Musker's, Musker's raid, was actually doing. Deep Troth eventually came up with the conclusion that Masquerade was a phony who is just fooling the simple-minded people to part with their money in exchange for the promise of eternal happiness in some faraway heaven. This was published in a newspaper which caused much agitation among the followers of Masquerade. Some threatened violence against Deep Trot, while some others already started destroying properties while hurting those selling the newspaper. The local authorities, afraid of the public disorder that such followers might do, decided to ban the distribution of the newspaper containing the article. Deep Trot went to court complaining about the prohibition placed on the dissemination of this article. He claims that the act of the authorities partakes of the nature of hecklers, veto, thus a violation of press freedom. On the other hand, the authorities counter that the act was necessary to protect the public order and the greater interest of the community. If you were the judge, how would you resolve the issue? 2014 bar. Answer, if I were the judge, I would rule that the distribution of the newspaper cannot be banned. Freedom of the news should be allowed, although it induces a condition of unrest and steers people to anger. Freedom of the press includes freedom of circulation. Chavez v. Gonzalez, 545, Scra 441. When governmental action that restricts freedom of the press is based on content, it is given the strictest scrutiny, and the government must show that there is a clear and present danger of the substantive evil which the government has the right to prevent. The threats of violence and even the destruction of properties while hurting those selling the newspaper do not constitute a clear and present danger as to warrant curtailment of the right to deep trot to disseminate the newspaper. Commercial speech. What is commercial speech? Is it entitled to constitutional protection? What must be shown in order for government to curtail commercial speech? Explain. Answer. Commercial speech is communication which involves only the commercial interests of the speaker and the audience such as advertisements. Commercial speech is entitled to constitutional protection. Ayer Protection versus Kapulong. Commercial speech may be required to be submitted to a government agency for review to protest public interest by preventing false or deceptive claims. Pharmaceutical and Healthcare Association of the Philippines v. Duque, 535-565. Freedom of Religion. Distinguish fully between the Free Exercise of Religion Clause and the Non-Establishment of Religion Clause, 2012 Bar. Answer. The freedom of exercise of religion entails the right to believe, which is absolute, and the right to act on one's belief, which is subject to regulation. As a rule, the freedom of exercise of religion can be restricted only if there is a clear and present danger of a substantive evil which the state has the right to prevent. Iglesia de Cristo versus CA. The Non-Establishment Clause implements the principle of separation of church and state. 
The state cannot set up a church, pass laws that aid one religion, and all religious religions prefer one religion over another, force or influence person to go to, or to remain away from church against his will, or force him to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. Everson versus Board of Education, 330 U.S. Number 1. Q. Congress passed a bill appropriating 1 billion passes. Part of the money is to be used for the purchase of a 200-hectare property in Antipolo. The rest shall be spent for the development of the area and the construction of the Universal Temple for all the world's fates. U Tau F. When completed, the site will be, will be open, free of charge, to all religions, belief, and faiths, where each devotee or believer shall be accommodated and te treated in a fair and equal manner, without distinction, favor, or prejudice. There will also be individual segments or zones in the area which can be used for the conduct of whatever rituals, services, sacraments, or ceremonials that may be required by the customs or practices of each particular religion. The President approved the bill, happy in the thought that this could start the healing process of our wounded country and encourage people to varied, of varied and often conflicting faiths to live together in harmony and in peace. If the law is questioned on the ground that it violates Section 5, Article 2 of the Constitution that no law shall be made of respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, how will you resolve the challenge? Explain. 2016 Bar Answer. The contention must be rejected. The use of the site temple will not be limited to a particular religion sect. It will be made available to all religious sects. The temporary use of public property for religious purposes without discrimination does not violate the Constitution. Ignacio versus de la Cruz. Alternate answer. The contention is meritorious. The state cannot pass laws which aid one religion, all religions, or prefer one religion over another. Emerson v. Versus Board of Education, 330 USA, number 1. Non-establishment clause. Question. Recognizing the value of education in making the Philippine labor market attractive to foreign investment, the Department of Education, Culture, and Sports offers subsidi subsidies to accredited colleges and universities in order to promote quality tertiary education. The DEX grants a subsidy to a Catholic school which requires its students to take at least three hours a week of religious instruction. Questions. Is the subsidy permissible? Explain. Answer. No, the subsidy is not permissible. Such will foster religion since the school give religious instructions to students. Besides, it will violate the prohibition in Section 29, Number 2 of Article 6 of the Constitution against the use of public funds to aid religion. In Lemon v. Kurtzman, 403 U.S. 602, it was held that financial assistance to a sectarian school violates the prohibition against the establishment of religion if it fosters an excessive government entanglement with religion, since the school requires its students to take at least three hours a week of religious instruction to ensure that the financial assistance will not be used for religious purposes. The government will have to come back a continuing surveillance. This involves excessive entanglement with religion. Question B. Presuming that you answer in the negative, would it make a difference if the subsidy were given solely in the form of laboratory equipment in chemistry and physics? Answer. If the assistance would be in the form of laboratory equipment in chemistry and physics, it will be valid. The purpose of the assistance is secular. Example the improvement of the quality of tertiary education. Any benefit to religion is merely incidental, since the equipment can only be used for a secular purpose. It is religiously neutral, as held in Tilton v. Richardson. It will not involve excessive government entanglement with religion, for the use of the equipment will not require surveillance. Question C. Presume, on the other hand, that the subsidy is given in the form of scholarship vouchers given directly to the student and which the student can use for paying tuition in any accredited school of his choice, whether religious or non-sectarian. Will your answer be different? Answer letter C. In general, the giving of school scholarship vouchers to students is valid. 
Section 2, number 3, Article 14 of the Constitution requires the state to establish a system of subsidies to the serving students in both public and private schools. However, the law is vague and overbroad. Under it, a student who wants to study for the priesthood can apply for the subsidy and use it for his studies. This will involve using public funds to aid religion.